contestant for the evening is Lois, Lewis Evans. He's a writer, speaker, and comedian just waiting for his Cambrian explosion. He's really excited to develop a metaphorical exo or Dor Darwin willing endoskeleton. <laughs> it's been said, you can always tell a Harvard man, but you can't tell him much. And well, you can't argue with the truth. Come on up. Hi, everyone. Today we'll be... Today, we'll be discussing an issue that affects all of us, sleep. Humans sleep prostrate, that is, lying down. We demonstrate a wide range of preferences on which position to sleep in and which surfaces we prefer to sleep on, but the preference for sleep lying down is nearly universal. The only counterexamples I could find in the medical literature were stories of the strange that were poorly attested. This suggests that the preference for prostrate sleep has an adaptive benefit. However, at first glance, that adaptive benefit is difficult to find. Sleeping lying down is kind of a terrible idea in the ancestral environment. When you sleep, you're vulnerable, and sleeping lying down increases that risk. It puts your eyes and ears close to the ground, where they'll be less perceptive, and your torso and pelvis close to the ground, making it difficult to get up. This increases your vulnerability. To predators. <laughs> to other humans. and to accidents. <laughs> so sleeping lying down exposes you to increased danger, and yet, as we discussed earlier, it's a ubiquitous behavior. Now, why might that be? Well, consider, hominids are the only known clade in which the spinal column is aligned vertically. During an ordinary day of upright activity, a human loses an average of 15 millimeters of height due to spinal column compression. <laughs> this animation is not to scale, but it's evocative of the process. <laughs> During a subsequent night of prostrate repose, the spinal column re-extends, allowing the individual to maintain a stable size over their lifetime. But if the sleep posture were not prostrate, the loss in height would be both chronic and cumulative. <laughs> the average adult human is 166 centimeters in height. After over just 100 days sleeping upright, the average adult would be reduced to a height of less than one centimeter by our model. <laughs> of course, linear models such as this one rarely capture reality accurately. Far more plausible is this exponential decay model <laughs> in which humans achieve negligible height in just over a week. Regardless of the rate of the process, the outcome would be something very much like this. <laughs> Now, of course, this catastrophic model is something of an exaggeration. The progression would probably not reach the point depicted on the prior slide. After all, the limbs and skull are fairly incompressible, and so it is much more likely that after about 40 days under the linear model, or four days under the exponential model, the average adult spinal column would be reduced to negligible height, and the decay process would look something more like this. <laughs> I would like to take this moment to thank my scientific illustrator. <laughs> now, as we can observe in this body shape, it's unsuitable for both walking and running, unable to reach high objects or engage in throwing behavior, and would have no room for the important organs stored in the chest cavity. <laughs> in particular, without a torso of non-negligible size, it is impossible to expand the lungs and breathe, leading promptly to death. <laughs> So prostrate sleep is a necessary defense mechanism against this sort of catastrophic outcome. Now, when we have an evolutionary observation like this one, we want to see if it has explanatory power in other areas, which might help us verify it. We can't go back to the ancestral environment and tie up a bunch of homo habiluses so that they sleep upright and then watch them die horribly as their torsos are reduced <laughs> to pancakes uh, for both ethical and um, time travel physics reasons. So instead, we're forced to turn to contemporary observations to find supporting evidence. Can our model explain other observations in a way that might persuade us that it is true? And in fact, what we see is a wide range of, uh, a wide range of examples where this model has strong explanatory power. We begin with juvenile sleep patterns. Our model explains a great deal about this. 
Children sleep quite a bit more than adults, several hours more every night. Now, traditional or folk theories tend to attribute this increased sleeping to children's need to grow and develop, either physiologically or neurologically. However, under our model, it is entirely understandable as a consequence of juvenile dominance behaviors. Children place a great deal of social value on their height, especially as it rapidly develops. You probably recall worrying quite a bit about who was the tallest in your classroom, and probably somewhat less about who was the tallest in your office, unless someone there is really tall. <laughs> Therefore, children are motivated to sleep somewhat more to reap even the marginal social advantages of expanded height. Our model explains further exotic behaviors that children pursue <laughs> in order to achieve lengthening, and it even encapsulates some countervailing trends. For example, children are well known to stay up late on Christmas Eve, which is contrary to their normal conduct. But this behavior may promote shortness and help them remain under the clearance of the tree in order to access resources. <laughs> Nor is the explanatory power of our model limited to the juvenile life stage. It also explains quite a bit of adolescent behavior. Consider, for exa example, the college pre-exam all-nighter. It is counterproductive for academic performance and widely acknowledged to be so. But nevertheless, it's common to ubiquitous. Therefore, we propose that it represents an atavistic strategy for an emergency reduction in size in order to avoid a hostile organism. <laughs> in this case, an exam proctor. Finally, our model also has implications in adulthood. Consider the social science finding that tall people are somewhat likely to be wealthier and vice versa. There are a lot of studies that demonstrate this and a lot of complicated models as to how this might come to pass. But under our model, this difference can be almost entirely explained by the different reclinability of airplane seats in first class and coach. <laughs> You'll notice that the first class seat reclines fully, while the coach seat barely reclines at all. The average American flies several times a year, and so this effect is powerful enough to explain nearly all the differences in height. And indeed, when we searched for further literature, which I unfortunately wasn't able to put up here, uh, we found that this effect is stronger among professions that lead to increased flying. Doubtless, there are many more features of our lives that are explained by this phenomenon, but what is perhaps most remarkable about it is its ability to bring a real benefit for you in the audience today. So if you take away only one thing from my talk, remember, sleep your way to greatness. Thank you.